George Kirkpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. Dr. Sharice Johnson is in the house. She's an author, speaker. She has a practice based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, we're based in Syracuse, New York. We have a lot of Charlotte transplants there. She's a, a psychotherapist, licensed psychotherapist, uh, whose work focuses on the intersection. Don't you love that word? The yes. intersection of trauma, somatic integration, spirituality, and social justice. Now, what's interesting, somatic integration mm -hmm. and trauma, those are the two things I want to really like hone in on. And yeah. let's talk about trauma, especially as it relates to Black bodies in particular, because mm -hmm. that's, for, for many of us who just recently, uh, well, in, in Syracuse, we've had two incidents, right? Mm -hmm. um, recently, uh, but first, let's talk about what the country's talking about, the beating death of Tyree Nichols by five Memphis police officers and the impact that that's had uh, on us, many of us who watched the video or didn't watch the video, mm -hmm. as you might suggest, right? Yes, yes. And, and, and And also, even in our own community, we have a case uh, with a young lady, United Chaplain, who um, has... Is, is intending, I believe, to file a lawsuit against the local police for an incident that happened a few weeks ago uh, regarding a police incident regarding uh, with her. She ended up in the hospital uh, because of the because of the interaction with the police. Now, the police, you know, they 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 showed a video. They're showing from their perspective what they believe is some uh, aggression on her part or what they describe as aggression on her part. Uh, that's what they say, right? Um, and that's what the you know because there was some thing that she did. You know, she spit on the officers. Okay, yeah. and, But what wasn't what what the community is saying is the actions of the police don't justify what ended up happening to her. She ended up uh, hitting into the skate or the window or whatever through the force of the officers trying to restrain her, and so um, that. Is, is uh, that's a situation that we're dealing with in our community now? Our I'm I'm giving you all this explanation because there's mm -hmm. some kind of relationship, so I want to be very careful in how mm -hmm. I explain it, and also for our community so that they don't you know say you didn't get it right. So anyway, <laughs> they so the community is very upset and they want justice for Unaya because she's you know been hospitalized based on that incident, um, which we which was also having to do with uh, a pizza shop and a tip jar that's how it all ended up and now she's hospitalized uh because of that incident so the police you know they came out and said this is not the same as tyree nichols but there is a video uh as well of of, of that incident uh and in both instances uh the officer was black but most people some people will say it's not the same it's a different thing um than what we saw in tyree nevertheless there's a video yeah. um, and um, for some people watching these black bodies, um, no matter how it came to be being beaten yet again, um, being brutalized yet again, is something that's a lot for us to take. Mm -hmm. And you argue, maybe we don't need to take it in as much as we do. And and not even an argument, right? It is based on what we know. You mentioned the word earlier in terms of somatic integration. Soma means body. In essence, everything we think, we experience, and we see gets held in our body. And we know from years of research and science done by people all over the world that people of color, specifically Black Americans, hold a higher level of trauma mm. based on the fact that we carry 14 generations of DNA in our body already, right? Mm. So we're already carrying the, the generational trauma and the mm -hmm. generational gifts, let me throw that in there, right. of those that experienced enslavement and that's not something that you get away from. So it's going to settle in our body in a different way. It's also why in many ways we have poor health outcomes 
because of what we care, you know, you think about the dynamic of COVID and how that hit and all of all of these pieces interact. Our bodies are coming into this situation and we are not well. And even if we think I'm so used to seeing it, it doesn't bother me anymore. Your body remembers. There's a concept mm -hmm. that um, a person who is high in somatic integration says the body keeps the score, mm -hmm. right? So it's held in your fascia. It's held in your tissue. It's held in those moments where you go, man, I had a quick reaction to that. And I, I went from zero to a hundred because it's all built up over time. So we have to be careful what we see and what we take in because it shows up in every part of our life. And so was it, is it your argument um, that we don't consume the videos of a Tyree Nichols or reliving the trauma of Rodney King or of uh, Laquan McDonald or any of the other young people uh, or women and men who have whose lives have been taken uh, through law enforcement? Yeah, the argument is not you can't watch a video or you shouldn't, right? There's no absolute. It's recognizing if I'm watching the video What's the motivation? Mm -hmm. Am I aware of what this is doing for me? If I'm watching it because I'm in some type of social advocacy and we're using this to help build a case or we're using this to help our community or to create education, which isn't completely necessary, but there might you might feel like there's a purpose to it. That's one thing. But if you notice I am consumed with watching this, I can't stop watching it. It makes me angry. It makes me upset. It makes me anxious. It makes me get on my kids more before they leave the house. Then, you know, watching it is counterproductive to your body, your spirit and everything that you're going to. So my thing is there should be choice around. I want to watch that video. So I, as an adult, I'm going to a space where I'm choosing to watch that video versus everywhere you turn. There are different pieces of the video where you feel like I can't get away from it. And then especially the families, right? So you, you think about the woman that you described and what she's experiencing. She has a set of very real emotions around what it also means to her to know that the whole world has now pictured her in light of this video, right? You don't know anything about me, but your first reality into who I am is a video that comes through the eyes of my abuser. Mm -hmm. And so the abuser gets to tell the story. And then for the individuals that are involved, if they're living or even if they're not, they're dehumanized. Mm. They're not looked at as people and looked at in terms of who they are. It just it's another black woman or another black guy that was doing something they weren't supposed to. So it's a dual protection. Um, and did I not call you Dr. Sharice Johnson? I hope I did. And if I didn't, I didn't. I am going it's to all now. Good. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's all good. It's all good. We looked at. I was like, oh Lord, I just called her Sharice, Dr. Sharice no, Johnson. That good. man, called, you know, uh, I don't want your parents to get on my case. Nah, they won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, here's what I'm hearing you say, for real, for real. Um, and this reminds me of the work of Resma Monica in his book, My Grandmother's Hands. And I'm sure mm -hmm. you're familiar with that because mm -hmm. dealing with the same sort of mm -hmm. uh, this idea that we've got to be aware that of the impact of trauma on our bodies and we're just not aware of it. And so mm -hmm. whether, you know, depending upon when you live in communities and, and the what some might because I think about this, right? when we 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 lost a, we lost a child in in this community not too long ago mm. and what i said uh in, in by through a drive by and what i said yeah. to the school superintendent i said if this had happened in one of our neighboring communities the first thing we would have heard was that counselors are on the, available now in the school district they have that and it's all, it's it's all, they have it and they have a crisis response team and they did all of those things, but the way it's reported is not that that's available to the kids, even though it is available. Mm -hmm. But when it happens outside, what am I saying? What it, it implies is that this is normal over there yeah. and it's not normal over here. Mm -hmm. And so, be, so we got to really take the extra special special. Mm -hmm. It's not normal anywhere. 
But or or, or I'll give you an, another example, right? And I'm, I'm just trying to make a point here. Mm-hmm. When when the um, opioid crisis, right? The way the news reported it was it hit home. Now, when it was over there, where was it? That wasn't home? Correct. That so, it wasn't given that connotation. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right? Hits home. Oh, you mean it affects us now. Mm-hmm. Right? So this idea of not recognizing the humanity mm-hmm. of all of our community or black community in particular. That's what I care about. I, I yeah. care about all community. Let me just be clear about that. But I know what you're saying in this particular case, we're focused on how it impacts the black community. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I'm hearing. You say that th- this awareness uh, and, and how it impacts young people. And we keep hearing about mental health, mental health, mental health, more mental health resources, you know, the state of New York, is talking about it. The county where we live and the city where we live, everybody's talking about Mm -hmm. addressing this. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet this idea of the somatic influence, Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's also being addressed or if we're sophisticated enough to understand that's being addressed. What say you? I definitely feel like we're sophisticated enough to understand it, but part of what led me to even getting into this line of integration is it is often withheld from the black and brown community because of the access, right? In order to be trained in somatics, first of all, you have to be in the position that you even learned about it. I remember when I was studying and going through and researching, I was furious. And I was like, why do we not all know this information? Why haven't we all been told this information? And then when I pulled it further and looked at how it was impacting black and brown individuals, I like there are thousands upon thousands upon millions of people. This is what we need, but it is not what we have when it even comes to those crisis intervention aspects. And so a lot of the people who benefit from somatic trauma healing are white bodied affluent individuals because those that are trained and those that have had the higher level training on it it's a it's months and thousands of dollars Mm. of a process in order to get the information to get the understanding to be licensed and certified to do it well so for all the black and brown therapists that are only about four percent out of all in the country, then there's all of these barriers to access. So the people who need it the most don't have it, which is why I wrote the book, which Mm -hmm. is why I put those things in there, because I want people to see a face that looks like them, a face that's walked through traumas of her own and know that there's a reason that you feel the way you feel. And it's not just because you're weak. It's not because you're lazy. It's not because you're unmotivated. You're Mm. self-medicating in a way because you don't know what else to do in order to continue to show up in your life. And there's more to it, but that's a big aspect that we're not given. And when people are given the understanding of how that all works, their eyes, their life, it, it, it is life changing. And, and we, it's past time for us to have access to this information. Uh, your book is called Expired Mindsets. Tell me about the book. Yeah. So Expired Mindsets essentially looks at where are you holding on to things that no longer serve you? Mm-hmm. And it really integrates this whole concept of maybe when I was younger, things constantly came in my way. Nothing was ever stable. I didn't know what to expect. So my way of protecting myself was I can do it by myself. I don't need anybody's help. I'm going to pull back. I'm going to isolate. That was survival at age 5, 10, 15. Mm-hmm. Fast forward. You get married, you get in a relationship. Every time things get tense, you pull back. You don't say anything. You don't connect yourself to your partner because you feel like, "Uh uh-uh, I don't know if I can trust you. And that becomes a mindset that has now expired its use. Survival in one season, but a barrier in another. And so it takes you through how to understand and recognize what that looks like in your life. Because a lot of the things that we get frustrated with about ourselves are our own systems of self-sabotage because you're asking me to give up 
the mm-hmm. very things that I've done to survive. And I don't, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. This is what I've always done. I realize it's beating my head against a wall and it, it's breaking me down and it's keeping me out of this job and keeping me out of this promotion. But bucking up is what I do when I feel like I'm being attacked and it's the only coping skill I have. You know, uh, talking to Dr. Sharice Johnson, she's a mental health professional, somatic healing, integrative wellness, trauma, social justice. Um, can I just stay on that for a second? Because what I heard you say made me think of, you said, getting thing, getting rid of the things that no longer serve me. Mm-hmm. And I am I immediately go, this is Valentine's Day weekend, I immediately go to relationships, mm-hmm. right? Shifting away from uh, the topic at hand for just a second. Absolutely. And and how people hold on to the idea mm-hmm. of a relationship that does not serve them mm-hmm. and then the trauma associated with it mm-hmm. and 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 this sort of cycle of I am like I know I this isn't good for me mm-hmm. and then there's that one moment after the escalation of the trauma mm-hmm. where it's quiet and everything is okay, but that's not real, right? right? So how does one cycle through that? Because I I don't know what, what you call that yeah. when I'm holding on to a thing, mm-hmm. an idea of a thing that really doesn't exist. It's false, it's not even real, mm-hmm. but I created this illusion in my mind that it actually does exist and that there's something good here. And it really isn't anything good here, Yeah, but I, I imagine that it is, and I talk myself into thinking that it's going to serve me, but I know it never will, and it really never has, but I hold out hope that someday it will. I know that's a whole circular thing. I was going to say, that's a whole show in itself. But in itself, okay. No, it, no but I'm, I'm here for it. Here's the, the short breakdown to it. That situation that you're describing is almost like, what we would say an unmet need, right? Mm. So let's say if I grew up and I didn't have a father in my Mm. life, which accurate, right? Right. And that need was to be loved and to feel the love from a male because I feel abandoned or somebody feels rejected from any male. When that need is something that you are starved for, there's always going to be this part of you that feels like, But if I can find a man or woman to love me, then I'll be complete. Then I'll be worthy. Then I will be able to love myself. So fast forward, you come across somebody who's like, oh, they got needs. Mm -hmm. But I can give them crumbs and they'll be okay because they want it. Because there are people that recognize the person that you're talking about that they know. But there's a part of them that goes, I want to be wanted so bad and I am so starved in that area that I will accept the crumbs because I'd rather accept the crumbs and believe for something more than I would to feel like I'm starving and that there isn't anyone available. I even talk about that a little bit in the book. I talk about people sit at a table of fake food. Right. Mm. It looks amazing. Oh, this mm-hmm. looks so good. This is so beautiful. And then you pick it up and realize I'm still starving. Mm-hmm. There is no sustenance here. It looked beautiful. I love the appearance of getting on social media and pretending that our relationship is great. But before we got out of the car and took that picture, we were yelling at each other and mm. screaming. And the diffusion and the up and down is the trauma cycle, right? Of we go through this tumultuous experience. But I also don't know what to do without it. And I'll add one more thing. Part of that can be. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Yeah. You said, and I also don't know what to do without it. I just wanted to hold that for a second and go yes. ahead. I just had to hold that, right? Yes, yes. And part of what I was going to say is I don't know what to do without it comes from if I grew up in a home or in experiences where love was dysfunctional, then that is my normal. Mm-hmm. I I genuinely don't fully see what's not possible because there's just this part of me that's craving the the stability, the picture, the potential, and the person on the other side, either our traumas are traumatizing each other, which happens a lot, and specifically in marriages and Black families, 
or we do this codependency dance because our bond is around our trauma. So there is a sense of connection around that I can't do without it because I am using, I'm used to receiving love that hurts. Mm. Did you just say a thing right there? I did. Right. And how many of us are walking around with that feeling, right? Okay. And that's the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and and, and so, yeah, it, it, it takes me to another part of this, taking it back to then, so what are we consuming? And that doesn't help. And then what do we allow? And so, okay, so <laughs> let, so can we break some cycles here? Absolutely. So if for that situation, mm -hmm. and then we'll get back to how we, what we, we're consuming and how it affects our bodies and, you know, watching these videos around police yeah, brutality. Take it anywhere you want it to go. It's right. Fine. So what's the cycle to break that? I'm used to love hurting mm -hmm. because I know right now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this is resonating for so many people who don't know how to get out of it, who, yeah. who think they want to, who no, they want to get out of it and they make the steps until they get the crumb. They get a little crumb, a little, yeah. little, 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 you know, a little crumb. Yeah. So, so it, it's, it's terrifying. Let's acknowledge that, right? Part of me wants to get out, but the other part of me is comfortable with this dysfunction. I'm a go into neuroscience for a second. And you tell me if you're like, wait, whoa, our habits wire in what's called our neural pathways. Mm -hmm. Our neural pathways mean the automatic unconscious ways that we engage with people are that comes from our lived experiences. So if I started that habit of love that hurts when I was younger, because I was in a home with a family that they were together, but it was volatile and I watched love hurt, that's wired in that anxiety, that tension. And even though I may logically know better, we do what we see, not what people say. Mm -hmm. We do what's modeled for us and what's embedded. So one of the most basic beginnings of the cycle is you've got to find your recipe. You've got to look at how did I get here? When did this message begin? What did I see that desensitized me to love that hurts? Along the same lines, if we put all of this together, if someone is in a situation where they grew up in a loving, stable home where people talk to each other well, had great communication, all those things, and then fast forward, they go into a relationship that is aggressive, they're in shock mm -hmm. because they're like, I am not being used to, to being treated this way. I'm out. This is, this doesn't match what I know to be true and to be stable. But if it's something that they've always done, oh, it's okay. Right. Cause there's this element that says, I mean, my brother did that all the time, but he's a good guy. Right. So we make excuses. So you have to look at what's your recipe. Where did this start? Where did you pick up these messages? You have to look at where are you making excuses, right? I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of, I'm all about your story and owning it, but we have choice. Mm. And we have to be willing to be uncomfortable in order to heal. So a lot of people will go, all right, I'm gonna let them go. I'm gonna let them go. But the pain of being alone and thinking, but what if no one else ever wants to be with me? That mm -hmm. pain, because it leads to the abandonment, leads to the rejection, is so high that if you don't have support that says, let's talk about other ways that you can manage that need, you're going to fall back to that neural pathway, which means I got to go back to what I know, even if it hurts because it's comfortable, because the brain loves comfort. Mm. You didn't say something there. <laughs> All right, so we we hmm, 
I'm I'm really thinking about all of that and processing all of that. And it all comes down to how do I, and you talk about this in your book, how do I, I'm just going to go, I'm going to ask the same question again in a different way, but mm -hmm. how do I get rid of stuff that don't serve me mm -hmm. anymore? A couple of different ways. One, I've got to be honest with myself. Mm -hmm. I have to own, it's not everybody else's fault. And there's a dual responsibility, mm -hmm. right? You either create or you allow. There are things that happen to us that we didn't have a choice over. But the moment I have information and I have enough logic to know this is not okay, then I have a responsibility to go. Healing is my choice. So we have to own that. Another aspect of it is we have to unlearn so that we can put new habits in place in order to create a new pathway so that your brain starts to create a fork in the road instead of going down the same path that it always has means I have to go get in a relationship with people that are healthy and learn how to receive that. Ooh. Learn how to trust it because we'll have people who are willing to give us the love we deserve and the love we desire, but we don't trust it. So we push it away. Oh, they're, they're boring. Uh, they're, they're not really my type because they're not chaotic and you find the chaos exciting because that's what you're wired for. So you have to own your part, unlearn the aspects that you've done, which means you're going to have to be uncomfortable. And then I'm also a big proponent of you have to work on what you're saying to yourself, your language, right? Mm -hmm. What am I saying and how can I shift from this is this always happens to me. I've just learned to deal with it to this is no longer OK. I'm going to break the cycle in my family. I want something different for myself and I don't want my child to also emulate this same cycle. So there's a lot of aspects, which mean you might have to separate from some of the relationships that you are in and really redefine what it means to be you. And, and, and in some ways we have to break up with that part of our identity mm. and go, this doesn't serve me well, but I also have to cut ties with a part of me that's attached to, this is how I identify. This is how I'm used to behaving and really learn what's the difference between who you've become because of the trauma that you've experienced versus who you really are. Mm. So circling all the way back mm -hmm. and then understanding that then allows me to decide what am I going to consume, how much I'm going to consume. Mm -hmm. And I guess from we started talking about police brutality and Tyrese Nichols from a social justice standpoint, in order to understand the truth, you got to see it and consume it. So tie all of that together for me so that I can well, make all tell of me this first. What makes you feel like you have to see it and consume it to understand it? Right. Okay. What makes me think that is because it's an inform well, so from my perspective, yeah, right? Yeah. Informed. Right. I know that in order to speak about something, I need to be able to articulate what I saw and and be able to explain it. To so the people as the voice of of as the voice in our community, as a voice in our community or I call myself the voice. Right. <laughs> yes. So, so articulating what I've seen is, is important. Mm -hmm. So I have to in, in many ways, I have to consume it. Mm -hmm. So 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 maybe that you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my own thing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Um, and yet there's a re so I feel a responsibility in that mm -hmm. work yeah. with me. And that was part of what I was saying at the beginning, right? If you are in a position where you know there is a level of knowledge and articulation and consumption that is necessary in order for me to operate in the purpose in which I serve right now, that is one thing. 
Right. But to the little boy at 14 who is in his room at night flipping through his phone, going from TikTok to Instagram to whatever else he's going through that's constantly seeing this vision over and over, he doesn't have those developmental skills. He doesn't know how to consume that information. It's another aspect of that little black boy sitting in a space and going, what, right? He could go all over the place in terms of I'm nothing. I mean nothing to no one. We're disposable over and over because there are no messages that he's getting when he sees that flipping and going and going that are encouraging him or breaking it down or telling okay. him how to manage it. Dr. Johnson, here's what I want to say. And at the same time, I don't want to deny that the crap is happening Absolutely. to us. And so that's the delicate walk, right? Absolutely. Because you, we run the risk of sanitizing, mm -hmm. whitewashing mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's where I'm struggling in some ways. Because With, If we pull it back too far, when it yeah. is given to us, will it be given to us in a way that is truthful? Correct. Yeah. And let me because and think about it this way, right? Mm -hmm. And this is extreme, but I have to use this example because it serves me right now. Yeah. Look at what they're trying to do in Florida. Look at what they're trying to do in Texas. Mm -hmm. Right. They're taking all. So by this theory, they're taking the hard stuff out mm -hmm. to make it more easy for white folk to digest. Facts. And what I'm saying isn't take it out. Get rid of it. Hide it. I'm saying create something where people get to choose. I want to see this. I want to see the truth. I have the resources and the support to, to work through and talk about what I've seen in a way that's going to be constructive and not detrimental. So we have to find the balance of making sure that we keep the truth, truth, and not have erasism continue to occur, but also knowing we have to do more to help our children, our young adults who don't know how to place all of this appropriately, depending upon where they've grown up, what they've go to school, what they already know and, and what they don't know. So there's there's an imbalance there and it's not a one size fits all. And then we want to do something for the people that go. I was beaten like that six months ago. And every time that video flips up, my whole body locks up. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm triggered. I'm sick. I'm in the house. I'm, I'm smoking weed for days because that's all I can do to bring myself back down and sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, the, it's the aspect of going, there has to be more that is done to make sure that the truth is there and available for those who need it, for those who desire, but also that it's not inundating those who are on the brink of we are walking around and our level of distress is like a little sheet of wet paper and it's too much for yeah. some so in summary we gotta monitor the intake mm -hmm. that we receive in the media social media and in life in general, and beware of the impact of trauma on our bodies and the protection of others whose bodies we have responsibility over. Yes. And as we're walking through this relationship with one another, mm -hmm. being accountable to the choices that we've made. And as you've said to, as, as I've heard you say, we may have to do some breaking up, mm -hmm. not, not only with the person who we believe is causing us harm, mm -hmm. but that part of ourselves that is attaching ourselves mm -hmm. to that harmful, those harmful actions. Yeah. And the last thing that I will add is we also, you know, people like you and other media people or therapists or church members, community advocates, whatever. We also have to make sure we're taking care of ourselves, which means <clears throat> if it's necessary for me to consume all of this based on the role and purpose that I serve, what am I doing that is also necessary for me to manage it and to move through it in a way that I am not eating my feelings mm. or feeling more anxious than normal or it 
has me mildly depressed because we can have a lot of high functioning depression where we push ourselves to continue. But the moment that everything goes off, we're low and we're down. So there's also the aspect of if that's what we're doing, what's, what's our outlet? How are we working through what we're carrying? Because you carry the story of every person that you talk to. Mm -hmm. You're holding space for it. It doesn't leave you. It, you remember it. You think about it. Think about how to connect it. And we can only handle so much on our load. It doesn't matter who you are, myself included. Dr. Cerise Johnson uh, really enjoyed the conversation today. Her book, Inspired Mindsets. Spell your name so people can get that website. <laughs> Absolutely. It's C-H-A-R-R-Y-S-E. Website is www.drcharise.com. Dr. Charisse, C-H-A-R-R-Y-S-E. Yes. Dot com. Author, speaker, uh, therapist, you name it. She's doing it. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing uh, your thoughts with us. Get that book, in Expired Mindsets, and let go of some stuff that has uh like like luggage some things you have to drop off that's right and, and leave it and, and and don't claim that baggage that's my, my <laughs> i love it <laughs> george kirkpatrick inspiration for the nation